Hey everyone, this is Logan Hertz with Hazeltine LLC, and we are super excited to have with us today in the studio the man himself, Caleb Gilliams of Better Wealth, a guy who uh, probably needs no introduction, but in case you haven't heard of him, he is one of the titans in the infinite banking community, and uh, we're excited to have him with us today. Caleb, how you doing? Logan, it is an honor to be with you, and I'm excited to jam with you for for uh, this hour, man. It's It's going to be awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this is unscripted. We have really no framework at all because uh, that's the way Caleb wanted it. And we're going to just kind of go off the cuff. So, uh, so Caleb, but I, I always like to start with your why. What, t- yeah. Tell me your why, your backstory. Why do you do what you do? Yeah. I, I, I think my audience may may not know you at all. Yeah. So the I'll, I'll give the backstory and then the why, which is very similar. So I, I grew up in central Wisconsin. I'm the oldest of six kids. Um, I remember being like very, very short for my age and I have a very hard time reading. Okay. So I want to just paint a picture for you. I'm, I'm 13 years old. I'm shorter than my younger sister. So I'm already feeling like insecure and I can barely read. And I had this moment where I made a fool of myself on stage when I'm like, took out a note card and I like sounded out every single word and it was just a disaster and I felt terrible and I went to my mom the next day in tears just feeling really depressed as a 13 year old I'm like I and she just said something that really stuck with me that paints the why to to this day she says Caleb the things that you can't control don't worry about like that's not your identity is not in that but the things you can control like your reading how you show up the work your work ethic you need to go all in on that and that really just like that that moment was just very much like, okay, I'm going to learn to laugh at the things that I can't control, but I'm really going to start taking control of the things that I can. And I, you know, from there, I got a couple of different jobs. You know, the job that really put me on the map was working at a bank. So I was 17 years old. I got to work at a bank and was the teller and we did a lot of things at that bank. But then when I was 19 years old, um, I ended up like working in our investment department. And then I ended up taking over the investment department. When I was 19, and I I essentially looked like I was wow. 14 or 15. How did that happen? I just have it, to ask it was so how, I got how does um, a 19 year old get told yeah, here? So here at 18, I started doing lots of different things, including working as an investment assistant. And the person that was running the bank's investment department took another job, and I was like the only person in this community bank that had like ties and had context. And so what turned to be like an interim, like hey, do this so we can figure out what to do, um, turned into, you know, a two, two and a half year deal before I left to start better wealth. And it was, it was on that journey that I read a couple of books, one, one being seven habits of highly effective people, which as you may know, talks about thinking with the end in mind and my mission and my why actually hangs on that wall. And it's what I wrote down when I was in my 20, when I was 20, it was to help people see and reach their highest potential. And so if you ask me what my why is, it's to help people see and then reach their God-given potential. And I feel like most people are living to a fraction of that. And then Better Wealth is a company that I started when I was 21, and we've been doing it for seven plus years. Um, And with this belief that like, hey, the internet is not going anywhere. What if we could educate people on how to be more efficient with their money using infinite banking and other strategies and our vision and our why for that company is to make intentional living the new wealth standard. In other words, you're not wealthy if you're not living intentionally. And I and I would if I could do one thing, it would just encourage and maybe inspire, um, maybe just try to like get people, if you had to do one thing, identify what that intentional life looks like and reverse engineer your life, your time, your energy, your relationships, your resources into getting that thing. Uh, Because it would be a shame to try to like chase what other people are telling you what to do, what maybe Wall Street wants you to do, but it ultimately is not financing or funding what you want. And so uh, it's the better wealth vision and and why is very similar to mine, because I don't believe you can reach your highest potential if you're not, uh, if you don't know and you're not uh, seeking out what an intentional life looks like. So both of us do a lot of what is known as the infinite banking concept. And um, so I always want to start with asking that question, what is the infinite banking concept? Because I think that uh, it's it's a difficult concept for people to understand because it's kind of abstract. 
And there's a lot of different ways people use to explain it, some of which resonate with people, some of which don't. And there's a lot of misinformation out there about both infinite banking and whole life insurance and different forms of permanent life insurance, which are, you know, it's not the same thing, right? So in your mind, how do, would you define or explain the infinite banking concept to someone who's yeah. never heard of it before? The way the way that I would explain the infinite banking process is it is it there's it's a process of uh, of how you store and use your money. It's a process of how you store and use your money, and it really is making sure that you are optimizing and maximizing how you're storing and using money throughout your life. Arnold Nash, the the pioneer and founder of the infinite banking concept, um, wrote in his fam famous book, and he talks about banking is the most profitable business in the world. They, these are institutions that are getting money to flow to them. They maintain and control. They're they're lending out your money, um, and it's an asset to them. And and they're like they are institutions that are storing money at scale and using money at scale. And the infinite banking concept is just taking that how can we take what the banks have been doing and how can we take that model and optimize it for ourselves and so it's um how you store and we use um special type of overfunded whole life insurance policy to store your money why is that significant well in, in the first couple of years it's it's actually worse than putting your money in other vehicles like savings accounts or cds but long term you you get the the benefits of life insurance, which there's a ton, which we might be able to go into, and and all those benefits compound and get better, and you get to use your money. Hence, why we're a fan of life insurance because it's one of the only financial products that gives is gives you a guaranteed built-in loan to use your money while giving you all these benefits. And and so I wrote the book, the and asset, because when I was learning about the strategy, it was like oh. I can be doing this and I can be doing that. There, and that the was like an dollar. epiphany. It was like with the same dollar. Yeah. What's the value of giving $1 more than one job? And I'll go on a little tangent here, but like majority of the people listening and watching this haven't have a smartphone, ha have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And if you think about like, what does a smartphone do for us? Well, I don't look at my smartphone as an investment. But I, I can't imagine a life without it, which is kind of sad for me to say out loud, but I can't imagine living life without a smartphone. This got me up in the morning. It's my white white noise machine. It's my <laughs> alarm. It's maps. I text on it. I can call on it. I can I can go on social media. I can email. There's more technology than uh, on this than you know what you know people had 20, 30, 30 years ago in like supercomputers. And, and it's just, it's just amazing. I don't look at like, what's the rate of return of having this phone, but it's like, my life is so much more efficient by having this. And the way that I see life insurance the same way is when set up properly, I don't see it as an investment. It's legally not investment, but I can't imagine a portfolio without it because I understand all the jobs that it gives my dollars. And, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have as a, as a part of my portfolio. Awesome. Yeah. So there were two things. There's so many things you said that I wanted to respond to, but let's stick to two. The first one was I really, I really liked how you said store and use your money. And then I also like how you said, I don't care about return on investment. That's one of my big sort of pet peeves. If you watch my well, channel is I, is I when, continually jump on that, that not just that life insurance is not an investment. It's not yeah. just that, but that if you're just measuring return on investment, that's the wrong metric. You know, and that's what everyone yeah. obsesses over, right? Well, and but I want to, I want to, I'll push back on that a little bit. I care a lot right. about return on investment. If I'm looking at investing, I don't look at insurance. I don't look at funding life insurance as an investment. You have to store. I look at it as a place to store and use my money. Mm -hmm. And so it's like I don't. If I'm putting my money in a high yield savings account, the at the end of the day, I'm not looking to that to be the end all be all. It's the place that I'm storing my money to hopefully utilize in buying businesses, real estate, or other things. If I'm using my money to invest, I care a lot about return on investment, but I find that the big misconception is when people look at insurance, they're they're comparing it to an investment, and I don't think that's a, that's a fair comparison. And if you are comparing it to an investment, I don't think it holds a candle to good investing. Maybe, maybe average investors, you could make the argument, 
but any good investor will always be able to outperform what a life insurance policy can do. And they should outperform it, but that doesn't necessarily make life insurance bad. It only makes it bad is if you're comparing it to an investment and it's, and it's not. And I think like an, and you could almost have both. You can have the benefits of insurance and you can have the benefit of a great investment. So I, um, I think we're on the, the same page. I just wanted to make sure that that point was, was made clear. Yeah, you you can do both. And when you say and you're you're not because some people think, oh, so I can put this portion of my portfolio over here in this port, this other portion of my portfolio over there. And it's like, no, actually, what we're saying is you can do both with the same dollar. So if you want to make an investment, you can pay premiums into your whole life insurance policy first, then take out a policy loan and go and finance that investment. Now your dollars are earning for you in that investment and they're earning for you in your policy, right? And one of the analogies I like to use for whole life insurance is cash flowing real estate, right? So if you're looking at a piece of cash flowing real estate and all you're focused on is what is the total value of the property and how does that go up over time? And that's it. Well, you're not really seeing a lot of what, makes real estate such a great investment, right? You're just looking at capital appreciation and that's it, right? And so I think a lot of people, unfortunately, what a lot of people do is they get a life insurance illustration and it's not an illustration, it's numbers on the page put in front of them and they don't know how to interpret it. And a lot of people in the business don't really know how to interpret it. And so they use it as a crutch. And so they just look at numbers on a page and see how does the cash value grow over time? And they see, to your point, the return on investment it's not like 12, 15%. It's not phenomenal. It might be 4% right? Mm-hmm. over the long run. But that's only myopically focusing on one aspect of life insurance, right? Just like focusing on that one aspect of real estate, right? Yep. And so it's that's, that's, I think, what makes our jobs, I think, challenging and interesting is we have to find ways to show people so that they can see- yeah. But the broader it, concept behind it, right? Yeah, I also think that a lot of times people in our space focus on the wrong things. And mm-hmm. here's an example. If we're just looking at rate of return, if that's the only thing that we cared about. So you, your your policy grows, you borrow against it, you put in another asset. That's all we care about. I don't think inf- infinite banking or whole life insurance mathematically makes sense because you're mm-hmm. not really getting arbitrage. You're, mm-hmm. you're really not. And so I think there's a lot of people that are like making it sound like, oh, you get a dollar and it, you're getting four or 5% compound growth over here. And like it, they almost like want to create like a mathematical gymnastics on saying like, this is going to be like your dollar is actually arbitraging and you're getting over here, over here. And it's like, no, that's actually not, not happening. It could potentially happen in year 20, 25, 30, but what is really happening is we we sh- we get all the benefits of insurance and those benefits should way outweigh the cost of borrowing by the way mm-hmm. so if you if you understand like what's the value of creditor protection what's the value of safety what's the value of of tax deferred growth tax de- free use what's the benefit of having a permanent death benefit i was just talking to a family earlier and he was like so amazed. He's like, you're telling me I get all this cash, access to cash, but then if and when I die, this gets passed on to my family? He's like, how does the insurance companies like make that work? And I and I smiled because I was like, this person's focused on other aspects that insurance gives him and he, he's getting it and mm-hmm. it gives you liquidity. And with all those benefits, it should, it should cha-ching. But if we're just looking at the cash benefits alone, um, you know, I, I could make the argument that there's other vehicles like a high yield savings account that potentially could outperform right. A, right. a life insurance policy. Right, right. And uh, there was, um, I, I need to maybe, maybe I'll do a present- presentation on this, but I saw a presentation from a few guys who are well known in the industry, not infinite banking guys, but they are just whole life insurance guys. And they did a study and they said, okay, If I'm going to compare an investment to life insurance, which is not the right comparison, but let's try and make it apples to apples. And so they're not just looking at the cash value. They're saying, what rate of return would I need to get in an investment in order to get the same benefits that life insurance is giving me? 
And the answer they came up with was 17%. Mm. Like you would have to make a 17% return over the long run, right? To get the same benefits elsewhere that you're getting in life insurance. And even then it's not really yeah. that because what if in year one you die in your investment yep. didn't have 30 years of 17% compounding, you know? Uh, you should send that video to me because I would love to react to it. On, yeah, on my, yeah. On my channel. it's not well it's not public that's the challenge okay uh, it was it was a private presentation and i've got to you know figure out talk to the guys figure out okay what, cool what but yeah it would be yeah. i think it would be interesting to try to be as independent and objective as possible by looking at that but i i think when i just add taxes fees and cost of insurance you're mm -hmm. taking a rate of return of anywhere from like three to four and a half percent and you're bumping it up to like a seven to ten percent so I'm not, yep. by the way, not saying that life insurance gets you seven or 10%. No, I am saying in an alternative investment or in an alternative savings account, right. if you factor in things like taxes, like fees, like cost of insurance, you yep. would now have to start earning that every single year just to keep up with the boring old life insurance and the, and the benefits right. that it gives you. And I'm only talking about three benefits. I'm not talking about potential 15 others. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's the great thing. When with life insurance, what you see is what you get. Right. right? That cash value, everything's netted out. Right. Okay. Whereas these other numbers, oftentimes they were talking about returns. They're talking about a gross number. You've got to account for other things, right? Um, like you like one of the things uh that, that I think you may have mentioned, maybe you didn't, but it's an important one. What about the long term care protection that you get in whole life insurance? Right. I mean yeah. the, the chronic I think it's pretty expensive driver. late yeah. in life. You yeah, know? the chron chronic Ill illness rider, accelerated benefits rider is a value valuable thing and it's really hard to measure. Like what is the value of being able to potentially spend down some of your death benefit if God forbid you need to while you're alive? Yeah. Um and some you know, of there's value even, there. Some of them even come with critical illness. Yep. Um, so if you get heart attack, stroke, cancer, you can use some of that death benefit. There are even policies now, I don't know if you're aware of this, um, with companies I'm aware of, good companies. Um that have a disability policy stacked yep. on. Top. I'm not talking about disability waiver or premium. I'm talking no, about, we're talking actual, about a legit, yeah. an actual disability policy because yep. the thing, what they're finding is whole life insurance is such an actuarially sound model that has been around for over 200 years. They know how to price it. It works. It's bedrock. Yep. And so as insurance companies are having challenges pricing other things, like there used to be more standalone long-term care insurance policies. The problem was then, Alzheimer's and other things happened that just blew them up because the cost ballooned out of control. And so they're like, well, how do we help protect people because there's a need for future long-term care needs without blowing our costs out of the water? And the answer is, well, we can use this found whole life insurance as the foundation, and then we can stack you yeah. know, a long-term care policy on top. So what we're using, what we're doing is we're advancing ourselves that death benefit that's already actually yeah. really accounted for and underwritten. Right. And now they're starting to do the same thing with, as an example, a disability policy. Right. Love it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible.